Good evening. Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace, of whom you may have heard. Just as the underground was built to speed people to work in the 20th century, Squarespace can do the same for you in the 21st. They can help you set up your own website with a broad range of easy-to-use templates. No messing around, this is a way to gain an online presence that anyone can use. And their traffic overview and in-depth analytics features will help you to maximise your site's potential once you're up and running. Whatever you need, whether it's a blog, a portfolio or a business website, they've got you covered. It really is an all-in-one platform for all. Check out squarespace.com for yourself for a free trial, and if you like what you see, visit squarespace.com slash jagohazard and enter the coupon code jagohazard, all one word, to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Now, let's speed to the video proper. Something I emphasise an awful lot in these videos is the fact that many of the quirks of the tube, good and bad, are down to the fact that it was never planned as an integrated transport network, but rather as a series of independent railways that were bought out, amalgamated or otherwise forced together. Well, today I'm going to contradict myself a bit. You see, believe it or not, as early as the first decade of the 20th century, thought was being given to how the tube could be made faster, more efficient, and more integrated. The specific part of the tube I'm talking about is the UERL lines. These were the Bakerloo, the Piccadilly, and the Charing Cross branch of the Northern Line, which was also known as the Hampstead Line. These were independently planned, but got bought out either before or after completion as they ran into financial difficulties. This empire was founded by Charles Yerkes. Yerkes had made a fortune in mass transit in Chicago. What he brought from Chicago was American experience of public transport, and exciting new forms of corruption, but that's not important right now. The pace of life in Chicago was a lot faster than it was in London, a city new to mass transit, but that was going to change. When Yerkes came to town in 1900, underground railways were very different. In the case of the Metropolitan, the Hammersmith and City and District Railways, they were basically conventional commuter railways that just happened to run underground. And even then, only partly underground. Yerkes figured he could do better. His underground would be designed for speed. He would pass away before any of his new lines would actually open, but it was a philosophy that would inform the development of the underground long after his death. The most obvious point is the fact that the Bakerloo, the Piccadilly and the Hampstead lines didn't share any tracks with anyone else. One of the problems with the older district Hammersmith and Metropolitan Railways was that they shared track. A delay could have a knock-on effect across all three, and they still can to this day. This wasn't a mistake that UERL would make. Even where their lines shared routes, they didn't share track. It also meant that every line could be worked to its fullest capacity without having to negotiate over spaces in the timetable. This had been a source of a lot of conflict between the Metropolitan Railway and its co... its fellow... the other lines that used the same track. Although the lines don't intersect, they did share stations wherever practical. If you needed to change trains, you could do so without actually leaving the underground. They also sold tickets covering all their lines, so you wouldn't have to pay more than one fare. These innovations would later be extended to non-UERL lines as well. Bank, for instance, included lines operated by five different companies, but the station would be combined into one. Or two. The whole bank monument situation is kind of weird. Yerkes was a big fan of electricity. This was not only modern, but of course quicker than steam. Electric trains could accelerate and decelerate much faster than steam trains. They didn't need to stop for coal or water. UERL effectively took the district railway over in 1901 and pushed hard for electrification, which meant that the Metropolitan and the Hammersmith and City railways also had to be electrified because, whoops, they shared the tracks. 
And of course, the UERL lines under construction would be electrified from the outset. The first underground line to use electricity was the City and South London Railway, not one of Yerkes. But their trains were made up of conventional carriages, hauled by a locomotive. This was slow because the locomotive always had to be at the front of the train. The UERL lines, conversely, favoured multiple units, trains with the motors built into the carriages that could be driven from either end. There was no need to mess around with shunting at the end of the line, the driver could just walk from one end of the train to the other and be all ready to go. These weren't a totally new invention, the Liverpool Overhead Railway having had them in use since 1893, but they were definitely the way forward. The trains were speedy enough, what about the passengers? The UERL stations were built with lifts. From 1911, escalators were introduced, which were an even quicker means of getting passengers to and from the platforms. There was also a myriad of other features that helped in little ways. In those early days, every station was decorated with a different pattern of tiles. This enabled regular commuters, at whom the service was primarily aimed, to recognise their stations instantly. This may only have saved a few seconds, but in the fast-paced world of commuter transport, every second counts. As the underground evolved, more features would be added to streamline the experience. Sliding doors, easy-to-read signs in the Johnston typeface. A variety of things that, in combination, made for truly rapid transit. By 1933, UERL owned all but three of the underground lines, plus several bus and tram companies, resulting in even further integration. And in 1933, finally, the whole lot came under the umbrella of London Transport. Since then, London Transport, or later TFL, has been building on the legacy of Charles Tyson Yerkes to provide a speedy service worthy of the city. Remember that next time you're stuck in a tunnel. Hello all, I hope you enjoyed this rapid tale from the tube. If you did, then please do hit the like button and consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon for more. As always, I'd like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon for being the multiple units to my tube tunnel. And I'll see you all again very soon for another tale from the tube.